Okay, yeah, then yeah, let's just start. Um, so this is an introduction to, a, a, yeah, I hope a very, very easy and simple introduction to probabilistic programming with Python. And uh, first off, I would like to give you a disclaimer. So <laughs> um, this is not probabilistic programming, um, but I'll come to that in a second. But uh, more importantly and more seriously, um, I don't have a statistics background. And, and all the all the net knowledge I acquired, I, I did that because um, the problems I was I was tackling um, for this, I, I didn't really have the the methods or the tools um, to solve them. So I was just acquired knowledge on the on the go, and so I, I might be missing some some larger overview over some things. And um, yeah, as I already mentioned, so this is the first time ever for me to to give a presentation with a Jupyter notebook. Um, so now I would be really happy uh, to get some feedback what you think of this, because um, the cool thing is that I can just send this file around later and you can actually yeah, get to run the, the examples I'm going to show you today. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to give you a very short uh, yeah, introduction into probability theory. So it's, it's not a lot we have to cover. Um, so basically, probability is the measure of the uncertainty of a statement. So here are three examples. So yeah, what is the probability of more than 10 people attending uh, the seminar today? Or what is the probability of my code having bugs, although all the unit tests are fast? Um, but we could also yeah, ask some, some more grand uh, questions, like what is the probability of life on Mars? And yeah, prob the probability of uh, the probability P of an event A is defined on, on the interval between uh, 0 and 1. And an important um, concept for, for this whole talk will be the conditional probability, which is uh, the probability of event A, given that event B uh, has happened. So here are a few examples. So the probability of throwing a one on an, on an ordinary six-faced um, dice is, uh, is one over six. Um, but uh, given that this dice is, uh, is showing an odd number, the probability of uh, throwing a one is, is one over three. And uh, given that the dice is even, the probability of throwing a one is zero. So it's, uh, it's basically impossible. And uh, yeah, with that, we can, um, we can dive into the base theorem. Um, so we, we have hypothesis theta and we have data y. And uh, so from this, we can, we can compute the, the probability of, uh, of our hypothesis given this data. So this is what this, uh, this formula here is, uh, is saying. And we're going through each term separately now. Um, so the, the prior here is uh, the knowledge of theta before we've actually seen the data y. So all, this, this can also be some, some things you cannot formalize into mathematical expressions. Um, so this is just all the knowledge we have before we actually see the data y. Then we have the likelihood, which is the probability of the data given the hypothesis. Um, so this can be interpreted as the pl uh, plausibility of data Y. It's also known as the sampling model or the statistical model. And um, we have the posterior. So this is the result um, we get from, from Bayes theorem. So this is uh, yeah, the probability of, uh, of our, our hypothesis given our data. And so this, this is then a probability distribution for theta. And in the denominator, denominator, we have the marginal likelihood, or also called the, the evidence. But uh, for, for our needs, we can just think of this as a normalization factor. And uh, yeah, to give you an example, so I was once uh, debugging a program of mine. It was a, yeah, a pretty tough uh, problem I was facing. And uh, so after a while, I came to the conclusion that my, my code was actually flawless. Um, and I was, I, was in the, I was writing a bug report to the GCC compiler. So, which is yeah, used by millions and millions of people all over the world. And uh, during some gathering of material, whatever, for the bug report, I actually did find a bug in my code. And um, so, yeah, I had a very strong uh, prior that, that my uh, code was actually flawless. But uh, when I stumbled upon this, this bug, I actually had to update my prior. And my posterior told me that I have to, um, yeah, update my belief that my, my code is flawless. So this is, this is how you can think of these, this, this bi-based theorem. Um, 
So yeah, let's let's dive into an obligatory coin example. So I guess every probabilistic seminar needs at least one coin seminar uh, coin example. Um, so if we want to find out if a coin is fair, so that uh, head and tail is uh, has equal probabilities, we um, we can just throw a coin a few hundred times, uh, note down the, the results, and then we can we can try to see if the coin is actually fair. And um, so we, we start with the with the prior. Let's this is just a Gaussian distribution, and we believe uh, um, that the coin is fair because we had a look at it, and it doesn't look like it was somehow manipulated. <clears throat> and starting with this prior, we can we can do some experiments. So <clears throat> so after one uh, flip, we can't really update our our prior because it's just too too few data. <clears throat> Sorry. And yeah, also after after four trails, not a lot has happened. But yeah, and this is what I mean with these uh, sizes. So it's always oh, there it is. Okay. So after after sixteen trails, you already see that the distribution is shifting to the left, and it's also getting narrower. So um, this means that um, that we are getting more and more certain. So the, the narrower the, the, the distribution, the more certain we are about the data. And you see after 150 trails, uh, we are pretty certain that, um, that the coin is not fair as it was shifted further and further to the left away from, from the 0 0.5. And um, so now we can have a look at the influence of the, of the prior. So we're gonna run the same experiment again but with three different priors. So uh, in blue, we have the same prior as before, just the, the normal distributed around, around uh, a fair coin. Then in orange, we have a uniform uh, prior where we don't have any knowledge at all. And in green, uh, we are very skeptical about this, uh, the coin. We're pretty sure that it's, it's heavily manipulated. And um, with these three priors, we can yeah, run the, the same examples and you see how these beliefs are updated and after 150 trails, um, they more or less converge. Um, but um, yeah, there's still some, some, some differences. Yeah. So, so yeah, summing this, this up, um, um, a so-called Bayesian analysis, what we just, just did with these coins um, this gives us a posterior distribution, indicating the plausible values uh, given the data and the model. And yeah, the, the shape of the distribution gives us information about the uncertainty of the values. Um, and only in the limit of infinite data um, do all the different priors converge to the same posterior. So you saw after 150 uh, coin flips, um, there were still some differences and yeah, you have to go to the limit of, of in, infinite data uh, for them to converge. And um, yeah, doing, doing this analysis for all data at once or um, updating our beliefs with each new data point we get or with each new coin cost in this example, it both yields uh, same result, the same results. So this is probably not really uh, surprising, but it's, it's, uh, it's good to know because uh, this makes Bayesian analysis especially suited for, um, for situations where data is collected sequentially. So examples would be data coming from a meteorological station or yeah, uh, like ongoing epidemics where we get new uh, case numbers uh, every day. Um, but also if we collect uh, movement data of animals, um, this, this patient analysis is pretty, pretty well suited for this. Um, so, but yeah, let's finally dive into probabilistic programming now that we have all the, um, yeah, the background we need. Um, so probabilistic programming allows for this, uh, for this Bayesian analysis or inference to be completely automated. And we just have to define our probabilistic uh, models in, in a programming language. And um, so today we're just gonna use PyMC3. This is uh, probably the, the, most, the most used uh, probabilistic programming language in, in Python. Um, it uses some, some backends to, to transcode the, the models which are defined in Python to, to C code so that the, the execution of the code is actually pretty fast. And uh, there's a tightly coupled uh, visualization uh, package, which is called Arbus. And um, so this makes visualizing the results pretty, pretty easy. Um, so, 
yeah, let's, uh, for the last time, let's revisit the, this coin tossing example. And now to, to formalize it a little, it a little bit more, um, we, we need two assumptions. Um, so we, we say that we only get heads or tails as possible outcomes. So we have a discrete problem. And we assume that the tosses are independent of each other and that they are identically distributed. And um, so this, um, this makes the binomial distribution a pretty good choice for the likelihood. And um, in order to solve this, we have to know that the, the sum of uh, these independent and identically distributed uh, binomial samples, that they are distributed according to the Nulli distribution. So and, uh, with this knowledge, we can now specify our probabilistic uh, model. Um, and for, for prior, we're going to use a very flexible distribution, the, the beta distribution, which, uh, which has two um, parameters, alpha and beta. Um, if we, so there are some special cases. If we set both of them to one, we, uh, we arrive at the standard normal distribution, for example. And for the likelihood, as I just said, we're going to use the, the Bernoulli, Bernoulli distribution with, uh, with this prior as, uh, as the probability. And um, so now we can have a look at the code in, in Python. Is, is this large enough? Can you read everything? Yes. OK, thanks. So we, oh, uh, yes. okay. so we, we start off with some, some imports. So as, as you have maybe seen on Mattermost, I, I really like importing stuff. Um, so we, we say that we have 150 trials again. We, we set the true theta to 0 0.35, which means that we have a manipulated and not fair coin. Um, and we, we generate the data from a Bernoulli distribution with, uh, with the two parameters, which we just set here. Um, so then we, we actually make sure that we forget the truth. Um, and so PyMC3 works uh, with the, with the so-called context. So uh, this is just a yeah, synthetic sugar to, to make things a little bit more easy. Um, so we define our, our whole model inside of this width statement. And um, so here we set the, um, the prior to a, to a beta distribution with the two parameters alpha and beta. Then we set the likelihood to Bernoulli distribution. Uh, we set P to, to the prior and we feed it uh, the, the data we have generated before. And now it's just uh, simply saying PyMC3 to, to do the sampling. And so this is uh, more or less the concept of, yeah, just abstracting everything away from this, all the, all the tedious work. And we can just basically push the inference button and uh, when this is ready, um, we can we can print a summary. So we see we see the mean, the standard deviation, and a few other numbers here. And so with this Arbus package, we can we can do some some plotting of uh, of the of the trace. So the the right um, figure here, you see you see all the all the samples which were drawn, and on the left hand side, you see the the posterior for four different chains. So these chains are completely independent samplings and this this helps uh, the algorithm to to determine if, if something went wrong so if we maybe chose wrong parameters or something then this can help diagnosing the problems and so on the in the final line here we can we, we say that we plot the posterior and we can also set the rope rope is short for the region of um, principal equality uh, equality and um, so the result, result of, this, of this is shown in the next slide. Um, so here, the, the lower graph shows you the, um, the posterior. Um, and in green, you see the rope. So we just assume that um, if our posterior is somewhere in this region, around, around one half, then we say, OK, the coin is fair. Um, but this HDI, this is the highest uh, posterior um, density interval. So this contains 94% of the, of the distribution here. Um, so in this black and this green interval, they do not overlap, which means that we are, can be pretty certain that our coin is not fair. Um, so now we can yeah, start with our first a little bit more interesting example maybe. Um, so from, from talking to other people, I often had the impression that uh, for a lot of people, statistics just comes down to doing a normality test of some on some data. And as soon as uh, P is less than 
yeah, 0 0.05, then everyone is happy and the results can be published. Um, so, and we, we can have a look now how we can transfer this approach to, to probabilistic programming. Um, and yeah, so this is this is a pretty important uh, topic because so much is, is normally distributed. So and even on the on the old uh, D mark, you can see uh, a normally distributed curve here. Um, so uh, as a first step, we're going to load some data. So um, it doesn't really play a role what what kind of data this is, just for yeah, for out of interest. So these are some chemical shifts from an MRT. Um, but yeah, as I said, it doesn't really play a role. So we we plot the um, the distribution of the of the data here, and uh, on the lower part of the graph, you see indicated as a rug plot, you see the actual data points. And uh, so you, just just from looking at it, you might assume that this could be normally distributed, but we have some uh, we have two data points which are pretty far away from the from the mean of the data, and yeah, we're not sure if these are if, the, if these are outliers or or what's going on with this, and for this we, we can we can try to to analyze the problem now. <clears throat> um, so let's let's start off by specifying specifying our our model again. So. Um, this time we need two priors. We need a prior for the for the mean of, of our normal distribution, and we need a prior for the standard deviation of our normal distribution. And we're going to start out with the with the uniform mean, which is yeah, more or less uh, pretty broad, and roundabout covers uh, the the x-axis of the data. And um, for the for the standard deviation, we use a very flat um, yeah, half normal, so the absolute of of a normal distribution. And with these two priors, we can we can define our likelihood, which is a normal distribution with uh, mu and sigma as, as the two parameters. And uh, putting this into pi MC3 is, is really simple, really, really uh, concise. Um, so we start out with this uh, with this context manager again. We define the two priors, as I've just shown before. And then we define the likelihood as a normal distribution. And we press the inference button again, and we're done. Um, we we can plot some yeah diagnostic plots again, but um, so how can we now check if uh, if we have done a good job with in, in, in fitting the data if we have gotten the right um, model with the, with the normal distribution? Um, for this, we can use so-called posterior pred uh, predictive checks because uh, now that we have the distributions of these parameters, we can actually generate predictions. We call them um, y hat and um, um, so from, from these, we can generate the posterior predictive distribution. So this is just this, uh, this integral here on the right-hand side. And it contains the, the posterior, uh, which comes from Bayes' theorem. And we have the likelihood of, uh, of the generated predictions from our model. And um, so conceptually, and also this is the way uh, this, this integral is approximated, um, we take some samples of, uh, of theta from the from posterior, and we feed that into the likelihood um, with the generated data. And uh, you should keep in mind that this contains two sources of uncertainty. So for, for one is the parameter uncertainty, and the second one is the, the sampling uncertainty coming from both of these terms. And uh, so now we can we can compare this to uh, these, these generated um, predictions um, to the actually observed data and we can check for, for consistencies. So let's make this a bit larger. Um, so this is also really simple again. Um, we just uh, tell PyMC3 to, to do this uh, posterior predictive sampling. We feed in the, the data we got from, um, from, from doing this, this inference. We, we have to give it the, the model. And so this is, I think this is a bit clunky, but um, we have to somehow merge um, the predictions into the inference data. So both of these are dictionary-like like, um, data structures. But as soon as we have done that, we can very easily plot the results um, with Arvis. And so we, we say we want to plot the, um, the, the actual data and the um, 100 of these samples, these predictive samples. And uh, so in black, you see the, the data. This is basically the, um, the curve I showed you before when, when we had a look at the data with this rug plot below. 
And in blue, you see you see hundred of these um, posterior predictive sampling results. Um, so and um, yeah, de depending on what you actually want to achieve with your model, um, this might already be yeah good enough. So uh, more or less, the the general trends are, are matched quite well. But you see that the the blue curves they are shifted a little bit to the right. Um, this is due to these two outliers, um, which are far away from the mean, and due to this, um, the the curves are also a little bit too flat. Um, but as I said, so maybe maybe this this would already be enough for um, for some applications. Um, but uh, we might we might already uh, also say that that our model is not good enough that we can't really capture the these these outliers and um, for this we can we can now pretty easily adapt our model and uh, see if we find a better model and um, so a pretty um, obvious choice for this is the the student's t distribution it's uh, it's it's it can be pretty similar to the normal distribution but it has um, it has three parameters so the mean which is yeah, absolutely unlocked to the mean of the normal distribution. It has the scale as a second parameter. Um, this has a lot of similarities to the, to the standard deviation of the normal distribution, but there are differences. Um, but yeah, it it always helps to think of the scale as the standard deviation. Um, and the third parameter is the so-called normality parameter. And um, it's called normality parameter because it can basically yeah, do some kind of interpolation between the normal distribution and some very, very heavy tailed distributions. So if you set uh, the normality parameter new to, to one, we uh, we retrieve the Cauchy or the Lorentz distribution. And these are very, very heavy tailed distributions. Um, and if, if uh, new tends to infinity, we actually retrieve the, the normal distribution. And uh, one thing you, could, you should keep in mind is that um, these distributions can get so heavy tailed that uh, um, the mean or even the, the the standard deviation or the variance are not defined if new gets too small. And uh, so let's just have a look at how they look like. So um, for new equals one, you see that yeah the, the tails are, are pretty pretty significant. And uh, if we increase new, um, we we more or less uh, tend towards uh, this dashed line, which is actually actually the normal distribution. Um, yeah, diving into oh no, no let, let, of course we have to we have to first um, uh, define our our model again. So um, we need three priors now because we have three parameters. Um, so for the for the mean, we we increase the upper bound of the uniform distribution a little bit to incorporate the these two outliers more. Um, we take a half normal standard deviation um, and we, we choose an exponential um, distribution for the normality, which is shifted yeah, pretty far towards lower uh, values of, of new. And with these three, three parameters, we can define the, the likelihood, which is student's distribution. And um, yeah, converting this into, into Python code or PyMC3 code, we again start with this, um, this model context and uh, define the three um, priors, mu, sigma, and nu. Then we define the likelihood. And again, we press the inference button, do some, some plots. Um, and now we can also print uh, the, the, the summary of some statistics of both models. So which you see below these, these reddish uh, outputs. Um, so you see that the, the mean of mu is pretty similar. So 53 and yeah, nearly 53. Um, the, the standard deviation and the scale, they, they differ quite a lot. Um, so uh, the, the student's T model is gonna be much narrower than the, than the Gauge model. And uh, we can also see that new is pretty small. So three and a half, um, this indicates that the, um, the distribution is not very normal. And um, so we can have a look at the, at the posterior predictive checks again. Um, so this is this is exactly the same code as you've seen before, and now you see that these hundred um, samples that they match the the black line much better, so they are not shifted to the right anymore, and you also see that uh, every once in a while you get uh, you get samples which which have a high value for these upper values, and um, so of course we we introduce a third parameter, 
but uh, maybe it's important for our application that we somehow um, account for these outliers. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's all um, we're going to do with with these um, Gaussian um, applications. Let's move on to the next example, to a linear regression. So um, I guess all of you have somehow, well, at least seen people um, applying linear reg uh, regressions. So depending on what field you're working on, we have the independent or the predictor or the input X, and we want to model or predict the, the dependent, the predicted or the outcome Y. And yeah, a lot of, yeah, funny or stupid or sad things can be done with the regression. So here are four examples. Um, and yeah, of course, these are spurious correlations, but they're pretty funny nevertheless. So who knows what's going on with the stock rates which are awarded in the US. Um, but yeah, let's just quickly recap, re recap what, what linear regression is. It's basically comes down to the equation y equals um, some, some offset on the y-axis plus uh, x with a slope uh, beta. Um, but this is actually a lot more general than, than it seems uh, on a first glance because uh, we can do some, some variable transformations and we can apply this to all kinds of different equations like we can yeah, apply this to, to exponential functions or whatever. And um, traditionally, least squares fitting was used to, or is used to, to find the optimal solution for, for the intercept alpha and for the slope beta. Um, but we can also use probabilistic programming to, to find um, the optimal solution. Um, this is two, two advantages. Um, so we will get the, the optimal solutions for alpha and beta, but also um, <clears throat> without any extra work or without any, any efforts, we, we get accurate uncertainty estimates from, from these uh, analysis. And uh, we have a lot more flexibility in adapting the models, as you've just seen before. We can basically just simply swap out the model, see if, if another model performs better. And um, yeah, formulating this uh, linear regression in a probabilistic manner is also pretty straightforward. We just assume that the, um, the dependent variable y um, is distributed according to a normal um, distribution with a mean, um, which is equal to the um, the, the equation for the for the linear curve, and we have some some error or epsilon. <clears throat> um, so defining good priors can can be a challenge, and a reasonable starting point might be to to start off with very flat normal distributions for for alpha and beta, and for the um, for the error we might use um, a half normal or half Cauchy distribution if if the if the errors might be pretty large. Um, so yeah, we can direct dive into the into the code. Um, so first of all, we're going to create um, a synthetic example. Uh, so we 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 we're going to take a hundred um, samples, um, define the two true parameters, and we calculate the the error term, which is normally distributed. Um, from this, we can we can calculate the true y, and uh, by adding the the noise to the true y, we we arrive at our data, which we call y. Um, so in the, in the two graphs here on the left hand side, you see uh, you see the true black curve and the data scattered around it. And on the right hand side, you see the the distribution of the um, of the data we have. And yeah, so now we can we can start defining our model. Um, so we need three priors for the two parameters alpha and beta, and for the error. And um, yeah, so for, for the intercept, we're going to start with the with the pretty flat normal distribution, and uh, for the for the slope, uh, this is just the standard normal um, distribution, and for the errors, we're going to use the half Cauchy, um, which is also pretty 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 wide, pretty flat, and yeah, the likelihood we we already saw, we can put this into our Python code, and um, yeah, this is this is all pretty straightforward for the priors. And so this is this is something we haven't seen before. In PyMC3, we can also define deterministic um, variables. Um, so this uh, we, we could do everything by hand, but this just helps in in yeah plotting things or doing some 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 analysis uh, afterwards. Um, so this is just pretty pretty handy at the moment that we can just say uh, mu is a deterministic variable, which is um, so th this this means it doesn't bring uh, 
uh, so it's um, it's just calculated from from other distributions basically. And then um, we define our likelihood again, which has this normal distribution um, with with mu as the mean and epsilon as the standard deviation. We press the inference button again, and um, so here you can see um, that not everything went went as smooth as before. Um, so uh, if, if something is not working, PyMC3 actually tries to help you and, and um, print some, some warnings. Um, but in this case, this is not really a problem. Um, and we can have a look at the results. Um, so from, from the inference data we, we got from PyMC3, we can calculate the, the mean for the two um, um, parameters. Um, and then, yeah, we just do some, some basic uh, plotting and so in, in, bl in black, you see um, the, the curve we got from, from the, yeah, the optimal solution, which, which we got from PyMC3. Um, the, the band is the, is, is the, um, um, the credible interval, and in red is, is the true um, solution. So uh, you see, we, we did a quite good job of, um, of, of fitting this, this data. And... Um, so let's come to our final and a bit more elaborate example. So um, we're going to um, use a model which is based on ordinary differential equations. And yeah, you're probably all sick of this topic. Um, but um, yeah, let's let's have a look at how to model uh, the COVID nineteen outbreak. Um, so they can be they can be modeled um, surprisingly well by a very simple class of models, the so-called compartment models. Um, so you, you divide the population into, into different compartments. So in the, in the most simple case, this, these are three compartments. It's the susceptible compartment, the infectious compartment, and the recovered compartment. And each of these compartments is described by an ordinary differential equation. And the compartments, they are connected via some transfer uh, terms. So people in the susceptible uh, compartment, they, they can get infected by, by infectious people. Then they uh, they they yeah, get transferred into the infectious uh, compartment, and after a while they they get transferred into the recovered compartment again. And so these these are the three equations down here. Um, so, so you see the the time derivative of s equals to yeah beta, which is the contact rate divided by the total population, times the the amount of people in the infectious uh, compartment and in the susceptible compartment. And you see the same term again in the second equation, but with an opposite sign. So this 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 yeah actually means that people can yeah, get transferred from S to I, and you see the same again uh, with gamma, which is the recovery rate. And you see that people in the um, infectious compartment can can get transferred into the recovered compartment. So putting this into PyMC three, we first define um, a function. Uh, which basically describes the, the system of ordinary differential equations. And uh, so because uh, if we know S and we know I, uh, we can simply, um, by our arithmetic, our arithmetics, we can calculate uh, the people in the recovery compartment. That's why we only solve um, this, this problem for two equations. And uh, so this looks pretty similar to the equations we just saw. Um, so with the, with the two transfer terms, and for i, yeah, another uh, transfer term. Then we define the initial conditions. So we just uh, normalize everything to one. Um, and we assume that 1% of, of the people uh, are infectious. As the true parameters, we, we have a pretty high contact rate of uh, beta equals to four. This means that one person uh, on average can, can infect four people uh, per day. And uh, so the gamma, the recovery rate means that people need around one day to, to get recovered. Um, then we yeah, define the simulation time. And so because this needs some, some boilerplate code, um, I, I just wrote a small helper uh, Python package um, with which we can solve this, uh, this equation. Yeah, this, this, yeah, the system of equations. And we, we get our well, assumed true solution to the equation. And we generate some, some yeah, observations by just adding some some log, log normally distributed um, um, observation errors, and just to have a look at this system, uh, you see that um, 
yeah, beginning with just 1% of infectious people, um, this quickly increases uh, pretty dram dramatically. And um, after a peak is, is reached, when not too many people are left, so getting being infected, um, this slowly drops off and people start, uh, yeah, getting more and more, uh, more and more people start uh, getting recovered. Um, so now to, to the probabilistic model. Um, so we, um, we define the two, the, the priors, the two parameters, beta and gamma. Uh, we assume that they are log normally distributed. We, uh, we need a prior for the, for the observation error, sigma. And so here, yeah, this is, this looks pretty messy and I'm, I'm not very happy with how uh, you, you have to solve ODEs um, in PyMC3 at the moment. Um, but I think this is this is work in progress, and yeah, I, I guess this is going to look more polished in the future. But yeah, basically we just we just solve um, the system of ODEs, and uh, so with that we can we can define the likelihood and uh, yeah, press the inference button again. Um, so uh, yeah, we can we can do this uh, posterior predictive sampling again to to actually generate. Um, Predictions based on this this model we we have created with uh, with the posterior distributions of the of the parameters, and um, yeah we we just calculate the mean of the parameters. Um, we we then solve uh, the the system of ODEs with uh, with these parameters, calculate the credible interval, and then we do some some plotting again. And so you see. So it's maybe a bit hard to see. So in the, the red dashed line is the, the true solution we, we just created before. And in, in orange, you see um, the, the prediction we made with, um, with PyMC3 and the credible intervals. So this looks pretty good. Um, so that's, that was all uh, about PyMC3 now. But of course, there are a lot of different um, probabilistic programming frameworks. So for example, I guess the, the largest one is still STAN, which is written in C++. Um, then there's, there's Turing, which is, uh, which is an extension of, of Julia. And Num NumPyro is a pretty, pretty new comma. Um, it's also in, in Python. Um, and yeah, I, I had a look. So for Kotlin, um, there were only small proofs of concept so far. Um, so I didn't, yeah, I didn't really find anything for Kotlin yet. Sorry for that. Um, but um, just I, I want to show you that um, that all the things I showed you uh, in PyMC3 that they are not very specific to this uh, framework. So um, the things can be pretty easily transferred to other frameworks, and that's uh, just to show you this. I want to give you the same um, SIR example in NumPyro because yeah, we've, we've been using Python all the time now. Um, so NumPyro needs really a lot of imports. So that's why I just hit them in, in the second uh, helper package I just wrote for this, uh, for this seminar. Um, so the, the way you solve ODEs with Num or in NumPyro looks a little bit different. That's why uh, we have a little bit more overhead in, the, in, in this function, uh, which defines the system of ODEs again. But after this, this overhead, um, yeah, you basically see the equations in the, in the to lower um, lines here. Um, and what is pretty interesting about NumPyro, it uses, um, I think it's called JAX as a backend. And JAX is, uh, it tries to emulate NumPy, but um, it tries to compile everything to, I, I think, to C. And um, so for, for NumPyro to work, you have to basically replace all your NumPy um, code with, with Jax NumPy code, and um, so that's uh, yeah. It, it looks very similar, just that you have to add the J everywhere in front of this MP for, for NumPy. Um, so okay, but yeah, after after defining the the ODEs, um, we again define the the initial conditions, the the true parameters, the simulation time, and then we create the truth again with uh, with the observations which you see below here. So it looks exactly the same as, as before with PyMC3, because yeah, basically we just create the truth uh, up to this point. And 
so yeah, this is the, the numparo code now. So we don't use a context management manager anymore. We just have to define a, a Python function, which we just call model. Um, and to, to show you at least something new, uh, and not just transfer everything from PyMC3 to numparo, we are going to handle um, the, the initial conditions also as, um, as, as distributions, because um, especially at the beginning of, um, of a um, epidemic, um, so it's, it's not really clear when the first um, cases were detected or when, 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 when the outbreak was. Uh, sometimes you have gaps in the data, and so it, it can be it can be difficult to, to find a good initial condition. Um, so that's why we we have a pretty tight um, half normal distribution uh, distributed around the, the initial condition we we have. And um, so, but we have to constrain this to the interval between zero and one, because otherwise, yeah. Um, I don't know, we could create more people than we actually have. Um, and yeah, from, from this distribution, we can create the initial condition for, for the infectious compartment, I0. And of course, for the initial condition for the susceptible compartment, we just have to subtra sub subtract um, I0 from, from one. And so, yeah, this is the initial condition now as, as distributions. Um, and then we define the priors for the parameters uh, beta and gamma again. Um, this is yeah totally analog. Just it just looks a little bit different because yeah, PyMC3 and NumPy are different. Um, but you see this this J everywhere here, and so sigma is again the the prior for the for the observation error um, here. So this is this looks a lot nicer in NumPy. We just uh, solved the system of ODEs. Um, and then finally, we, we define our log likelihood, uh, yeah, our li likelihood, which is a log normal distribution. Um, and then, yeah, uh, we, we have to create this MCMC object. And with this, we can, again, push the, the inference button and do some, some yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure what, what went wrong here. I'm going to have a look in this later. But yeah, let's have a look at the, the um, results. Um, so again, we just do some some yeah pre-processing. We we do the predictive uh, sampling. We calculate the the credible interval, and then we do some plotting. And you see it, it looks very similar. So there are some differences. So this is just due to the different algorithms they use for for the for the sampling. Um, but uh, yeah, all in all, they, they work very similar and arrive at similar results. And um, yeah, with that, I just want to show you some some literature um, for you to to yeah dive deeper into this topic. Um, so I, I actually found two books um, where they give an introduction to probability programming using PyMC3 and Arvis. Um, but there are also a lot of pretty good uh, PyMC3 notebooks where you can have a dive into all kinds of different topics. So there, there's also a strong focus on on machine learning. Um, there's an active discourse channel uh, where people are really happy to, to answer your questions pretty fast. Um, yeah, and with that, I want to thank you for, for attending this, this seminar today.